Hello my bookish friends out there in booktube land and welcome to another episode of Tristan and the Classics. In this video we are taking a look at one of the 100 classic books that I think are worth your time to read. The 100 classic books is a series I'm developing over a long period of time after giving a great amount of thought to the classic books that I work my way through and this one is the incredible Eugenie Grandet by Honor de Balzac. So, what's so good about this book? Why do I think you should read it? What's it about? Without further ado, let's dig in, shall we? The book Eugenie Grandet by Balzac is one of the many books which form his human comedy. The human comedy is not so much a series where you read books in succession. It's practically his whole corpus of works in which Balzac tries to grasp hold of all of Parisian society and through that lens to examine what makes human life the way it is and our interactions with one another. He looks at all strata of society from high to low, he looks at adventurer to rake from miser to altruist from noble to commoner. Um, and he tries to grab hold of the, the essences of what makes us and the people we know around us. Eugenie Grandet is one of them. It's actually one of the shorter ones. A number could be picked from his whole corpus of works. You think of Olgorio as a good one, Cousin Bet, the, the Skin of the Ass, which is sort of a magical realism. But I just picked this one because it's a great example of a classic book doing its job well. Classic books, they combine either beautiful or imaginative writing with a good story that gives you an insight into yourself, that gives you pause for thought, that makes you slow down and begin to see the world or sense your emotions in a stronger form. Now, with Eugenie Grandet, the study or the meditation, as it were, that's what I'd call this, it's more of a meditation on an observation he's seen in people. It's about a miser. So you have in this book, Monsieur Grandet, who has a young daughter called Eugenie, so Eugenie Grandet. And they live in the posher part of the town of Saumur, and they live in quite a dilapidated house because he doesn't believe in spending a lot of his cash. He likes to accumulate gold. He loves gold. But this is no fairy tale dragon character. This is a very, very real rounded character. And what Balzac does through this book is he explores the, 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 the claws, the hooks, that a love of money gets into a person. But not just in that one person and how they cannot see it, but how that person becomes a sort of a, a center, a locus point for many people around them. And they get caught in the swirl of a very rich but miserly character. And how the desire for money, although it, we may not be miserly, everyone has a certain desire for money, how we are drawn into that nexus of a wealthy miser. But on top of that, you have his daughter, Eugenie, who she's grown up in his household. She doesn't even know how much money he's got. Um, and she doesn't really think in terms of money, unlike her father. And that's not because she's repulsed by her father. She just never thinks about it. She's taken her life for granted. You also have in the household, Madame Grandet, um, Monsieur Grandet's wife. And she is she somewhat kowtows to whatever he says. She tries to make do as well with the daily allowance that he gives to the family. And the allowance is not just money, it's also um, food supplies. He distributes it through his maid, Nanon, this great stocky woman with a blotchy face who normally wouldn't have got work, but he picked her because he liked her, her strength and he thought she could be very useful in the household. He's very practical minded. And she really has an affection for her master because he took her in where no one else would look at her. Um, but nonetheless, as the story develops, you see how Nanon has a, a feeling for Eugenie and the, the mistress of the house as well. Now, the story. Because, Eugenie, because Monsieur Grandet has so much cash, Naturally, 
certain families would like their sons to marry Eugenie so that on the death of Monsieur Grandet, they will inherit all of his wealthy estate, which numbers into the millions of francs. And so you have these two chief families who work alongside Monsieur Grandet, and they are the um, Cruchots and the Grassins. And if you can hear me doing the like I'm doing French, please don't let it put you off. My, my French brother-in-law has told me that I should try getting this R ah sound right that the, that's in the French um, uh, phonetics. So these two families, what uh, Balzac calls the Cruchatons and the Grassinists, they are vying with each other to get an in with Eugenie because they, each of them have a son that they want to marry to Eugenie to gain the money that Monsieur Grandet has, because obviously at some point he's going to die. And you can see the sniping as both families constantly visit and they play whist and they play a game called Lotto in the very dark and not so pleasant uh, drawing room of the Grandet household because the house is relatively dilapidated because he doesn't believe in upgrading it. I'm not giving anything away here. You'll have to see how these two families play off against each other. But Eugenie, she's not really aware of what's going on. She doesn't think in those terms. She's had a very cloistered life. And then her cousin comes from Paris, a, a lad called Charles Grandet. And suddenly, the, the feelings of love come out in her, something she's never felt before. Now, how is it all going to pan out? Who is going to win Eugenie's hand? Will she become aware of money? Well, there is an awakening to that in the book because that's how Balzac is exploring, having a meditation on what a love of money actually does to a person and to those around them. So what will Monsieur Grandet's love of money and his miserliness particularly, what effect will it have on those people around him? And what this does, the way you read this is not just let it blow through your mind like you've got the window wound down on your car racing along and it's just a massive breeze. When you read this, you just need to saunter through the book as if you're walking down a languid street on a hot day where the wind occasionally whirls up small eddies of littered thoughts which appear to your mind and your realisation and your imagination of just what takes place in a human soul surrounding the idea of gold, of cash, of constant money. You get the balance here between the subtle revelation of a beautiful spirit and then someone who is consumed by the pale glitter of metal. And it really gives you pause for thought. It really makes you step back and think, actually, what role should money have in our society? Or maybe not in society, what role does money have in our life? We can often say, oh yes, you don't want to just be a greedy so-and-so. Uh, or, yeah, money's not everything. But what Balzac does is through the form of a story and written exceptionally well, he, he crystallizes, he helps you to see what happens inwardly when, for argument's sake, when mammon is your god or money is your god. And it is a really fascinating exploration of, of this topic. And of course, it's not unusual because Balzac took loads of different topics um, and themes to examine through life. This one is miserliness or avarice. You would, you would probably say like one of the seven deadly sins. In nearly all classic books, there is often a part of a paragraph or even sometimes just a sentence where you get a drawing back of the curtain and a revealing of the motivations of the author for writing the book. Um, it's almost their exposition, in, in short, of what they're trying to examine. And you have that also in this book. You sense that halfway through, Balzac reveals the idea that prompted this story, but he writes it and captures it so well. 
And I'm just going to read it to you because it sort of explains what the whole book is about and why it's so enthralling to read. Don't worry, this gives nothing about the book away. It's just where Balzac's thoughts seem to have leaked through. And I love looking for these little uh, fingerprints, as it were, throughout my reading. So it says this, the miser's life is a constant exercise of every human faculty in the service of a personality. He believes in self-love and interest, and in no other motives of action. But interest is in some sort another form of self-love, to wit, a practical form dealing with the tangible and the concrete. And both forms are comprised in one master passion, for self-love and interest are but two manifestations of egoism. Hence, perhaps, the prodigious interest which a miser excites when cleverly put upon the stage. What man is utterly without ambition? And what social ambition can be obtained without money? Everyone has something in common with this being. He is a personification of humanity and yet is revolting to all the feelings of humanity. That is such a beautiful observation of life. It's one of the reasons I love Balzac. Um, he's just astute in seeing the, what drives people beneath all of the outward display, whatever pretenses people put on, he sees underneath. And that comments that everyone has some ambition and what ambition is there that doesn't require money Hence why misers, people who accumulate fortunes, but they can't spend it because they love the money itself. Well, they are fascinating to us and yet universally despised. But we're still drawn to look. think of Scrooge, a really popular story which lasts because there's something about the miser we detest. And yet there's something about him that is fascinating mesmerizing to us because we understand the role of money and with with um monsieur grandet you see what just one of the ways he shows his his love of money is every new year's day he gives eugenie a special gold coin sometimes two and they are special mints of a coin so they have a particular value but they're nearly always 23 carat gold so they're very expensive, and to him that's the greatest gift. And he gives her, you know, Louis d'Ors, which are big gold coins, and you've got rupees of the Raj, so over from India in, in this day and age, but golden. He gives her doubloons, all those kind of things. You name it, she's got them, and she's amassed this pile. And every year he gives her a new one, but when he does, he says, let's get out all of your coins and let's look at them together. And he just loves fingering them and holding them. And there's some beautiful writing about his view towards money. We, get it, we go deep within his thoughts. Now, just to give you an idea of the style of writing, I will, as always, read the first paragraph of this book because um, it's actually really cleverly, well, not clever, it's really tidily put. So it says this, in some country towns, there are houses more depressing to the sight than the dimmest cloister, the most melancholy ruins, or the dreariest stretch of sandy waste. Perhaps such houses as these combine the characteristics of all the three, and to the dumb silence of the monastery they unite the gauntness and grimness of the ruin and the arid desolation of the waste. So little sign is there of life or of movement about them that a stranger might take them for uninhabited dwellings. But the sound of an unfamiliar footstep brings someone to the window. A passive face suddenly appears above the sill, and the traveller receives a listless and indifferent glance. It is almost as if a monk leaned out to look for a moment upon the world. Isn't that just a beautiful opening? There's a, um, a, a, a sparing of words in that, but we start off with a brownish, a sort of an embrowned backdrop of not the pleasantest buildings. And yet the inhabitant is someone who is wealthy. And so right from the off, we get this slow zooming in onto the house in which the grandettes live. 
and it, it does create the perfect atmosphere. And so this book is worthy of being read for multiple reasons. One, absolutely beautiful writing, even in translation. This is the Everyman edition, which I particularly like, and the translation is by Ellen Marriage, who was brilliant at translating French and keeping a very emotional feel um, of, from the original. Um, the other thing that I like about this as well is the, the very astute insights that Balzac has into the topic he's talking about. He takes the time to get you to realize a feeling. Because not only have you got miserliness, in this you have the awakening of love with Eugenie, and he captures it so well that it allows you to linger for a while in the deepest, deepest throes of new burgeoning love towards somebody else. One thing I'll say about this as well before you read it is the ending, and it's sort of a, it's, it's a bit of a stretched ending. Some could argue that it's not the strongest of endings to a book. If you're looking for catharsis, a real whoo, letting go of, of the built up tension, you don't really get it so much in this, but that's because this book wasn't aiming for it. This was a meditation. Remember, this sits amongst a, a great cluster of works. I don't know how many works it is. I know it's above 40, it may even be up to 80, of the human comedy. And what he does, really, is he actually leaves you hanging in suspension. The book does round off, don't get me wrong. It's not like a, a what actually happened at the end. You know what happens. But it gives you, he takes the, 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 the floor from beneath you um, through the eyes of Eugenie. Um, what is the depth of life? It's very, I can't say much more because of, because of not wanting to give anything away. But don't be disappointed by the end. It's not disappointing at all, by the way. Um, but it's, it's not your classic, fully rounded denouement of, you know, a work. It's just, it takes its exuant left off the stage very surreptitiously, really. It sort of glides out of you rather than the curtain drop down. And that to me is actually a pleasant thing because it left it, it made it very easy for me just to walk off still in the deep sensation rather than a, an alarmed or heightened adrenalized reaction of, wow, I can't believe that. I walked off still in the streets of Sommer, which is where they lived. I almost carried on being Eugenie for a day or so afterwards. It was easy to still examine the feelings and the effect of this miser's life on me. And it gave me a real insight. I actually would say it gave me a much more detailed and greater appreciation for the dangers of avarice um, on a deep level. So that's the book, Eugenie Grandette by Honore de Balzac. Absolutely beautiful piece of work. There are many that could be picked on the 100 classics to read from Balzac's work. And as I go along in the future, coming up with the others that I decide upon, there may be some more by Balzac. It wouldn't surprise me at all. But this is the one I wanted to bring to your attention. He is definitely an author that if you've never read, you should at least try. And I would suggest Eugenie Grandette as a good starting point. Have you read Balzac? What are you currently reading? And uh, which books do you feel are worthy of being on a top 100 list? Leave your comments down below. And if you want to support my channel, consider coming over to my Patreon and having a look there for exclusive videos uh, on our great literary adventure that we're going through over there, reading a set classic every month and then discussing it. Until the next time, I wish you joy in your reading.